this episode of In the Fight. A U.S. Army soldier advisor helps Afghan military leaders see the big picture. Airmen and Marines put in long hours to send supplies to earthquake-stricken Nepal. Soldiers test out a new light tactical all-terrain vehicle. National Guard members commemorate the World War II liberation of Dachau. And country star Trace Adkins performs for service members at Ramstein Air Base. Since the beginning of 2015, Afghanistan's military has been handling its own security, but getting leaders to work together is still a challenge. Army broadcasting correspondent Gail McCabe talks to one U.S. Army advisor who is helping Afghan military leaders find their place in the big picture. Battle tracking. What Captain Lorenzo Suarez says his job at Train Advisor Sys Command East is connecting the leaders of the OCCR, Operational Coordination Center region, with what it takes to operate in the big picture. They're very good at receiving the information from one guy, hand it off to another, but not really doing much with the information when they first receive it. His students are Afghan National Security Forces from multiple provinces. They represent the Army and police tasked with maintaining security in the region around Kabul. Their base of operations is forward operating base Gamberi, home of the ANA 201st Corps. The, graphical common the idea of this class is showing how merging all their information into a common operating picture benefits all. Because once they have identified roles and responsibilities, then they know their job they have to do. Everyone knows their, their place on the team, and the team is better overall. Suarez is one of some 60 U.S. soldiers assigned to TAC East. The OCCR is one of several in Afghanistan. The goal for both is building a team focused on making a difference in the big picture. Into the overall common operating picture. Gil McCabe, Afghanistan. Recent threats of invasion by Russian forces have only served to strengthen the United States' partnership with Ukraine. This continued team building means more for Ukraine than just political or military support. Army Staff Sergeant Leanne Kuat tells us more in this report. The Department of Defense is partnering with the government of Ukraine and other non-government organizations to strengthen the relationship between our countries. The U.S. Ambassador took part in a ribbon-cutting ceremony opening a new community center in the city of Venezia. There is a deep appreciation among Ukrainians um, about the support that they have enjoyed from the United States, from President Obama, uh, from UCOM, uh, from the State Department. Um, Ukraine is a good partner for the United States. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship here. The Ukraine is going through a moment of unique testing, and we are standing by the Ukrainian people jointly with our European partners, helping the Ukrainian people to choose their own future. The center is one of a series of renovation projects through the United States European Command Humanitarian Assistance Other Program. This joint effort is a collaboration of various organizations from the Department of Defense, the United States Agency in International Development, and the Ukrainian government. UCOM has also arranged a large donation of furniture and supplies through the DOD's Excess Property Program. These items went to four locations in Venezia, the new community center, a displaced person shelter, an orphanage, and a school. When you look at our agency, we don't just provide military solutions for the military. We actually do defense institution building and also as humanitarian assistance as well. So we provide actually an entire continuum of security cooperation solutions that impact all members and all uh, persons uh, of that nation. These successful cooperative engagements help strengthen our partnership with Ukraine a primary goal of UCOM. Reporting for AFN, I'm Army Staff Sergeant Leanne Kuat. 
Disasters can strike when we least expect them, which is why members of the 374th Airlift Wing need to be ready at a moment's notice. Air Force Staff Sergeant Brian Economides reports from Yakota Air Base, where C-130 crews prepare to help the country of Nepal after a recent crippling series of earthquakes. Airmen from Yakota Air Base departed for humanitarian relief operations to Nepal following a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that devastated their country. The airmen of the 374th Airlift Wing stand ready to provide support with other U.S. government agencies. The airmen of the 374th Airlift Wing and all of Team Yakota are prepared to respond to the request of the government of Nepal as coordinated through our ambassador, USAID is our lead agency, and the Joint Task Force is our command and control element to provide airlift, aeromedical evacuation, if needed, precision airdrop and aerial delivery services on order. The 374th's airlift capability and skill set provides a dynamic to relief efforts that will aid the people of Nepal with needed supplies to restore their nation. We deliver resolve, we deliver deterrence, but most importantly in today's circumstance, what we deliver is hope, faith in the human condition, and life-sustaining supplies. And while every one of these airmen is a warrior, Right now, they are compassionately focused on delivering aid. That's why we are here, and nothing motivates them more than this mission. The airmen of Yakota stand ready to support Nepal, providing airlift during their time of need. Air Force Staff Sergeant Brian Economides, Yakota Air Base, Japan. The series of earthquakes recently devastating Nepal have limited access to and from some remote parts of the country. One Marine team is looking to overcome these roadblocks, delivering food and shelter supplies by air. Marine Lance Corporal Mandolin Hatch takes us on one of these deliveries in this report. We have two UH-1 Yankees outbound supporting relief efforts, supplying uh, food and shelter to the local remote villages that cannot uh, attain their own uh, food or shelter. So right now, uh, we're about to go launch out there with them, meet up with them, and uh, continue supplying aid out to, uh, to the local uh, villages out there. So just uh, they are uh, dropping the supplies and other uh, essential things for the people in suffering in a remote part of Nepal. So it is helpful. Thanks for the Marine and U.S. people of U United States. Your help is very, very helpful for the Nepalese people in this, uh, uh, this disaster. Okay, so we just picked up 3,200 pounds of pits to Cherka, which is the main supply point to these smaller villages in the north. And we're going to Kapachanka, which is a smaller the small village out in the foothills of the Himalayas. So in over a week, HMLA 469 has flown over 54 flight hours. We've delivered over 68,000 pounds of uh, needed supplies to the outer villages. And we also plan to deliver another 140,000 pounds before we leave. Hi, I'm Captain Deb Miller, out at LED Air Base, Qatar. I'd like to give a shout out to my husband, Steve, my daughters, Maisie and Marcy, hi girls, and the rest of my family and friends back home in Maryland. Thank you so much for your love and support. I want to give a shout out to my wonderful mother. Uh, I want to say thanks for all the years you've been supporting me. And I also want to give a shout out to my wonderful wife, being an outstanding mother also to our kids and always holding them down when I've been gone and I was always busy, so outstanding. I know right now we have your hands full, but I'll be back home soon. Love you both. Coming up, soldiers test out a new light tactical all-terrain vehicle. And National Guardsmen commemorate the liberation of Dachau. Check out divotshub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. The largest earthquake ever recorded, which hit Chile in 1960, had what magnitude? The answer when we return.
largest earthquake ever recorded, which hit Chile in 1960, had what magnitude? The answer is B, 9.5. Soldiers with the 1st Battalion, 325th Airborne Infantry Regiment, 2nd Brigade Combat Team are some of the first to sit in the driver's seat of a light tactical all-terrain vehicle. This highly mobile vehicle will help make the Falcon Brigade deployable to anywhere in the world in 18 hours. Army Staff Sergeant Dylan Heiliger brings us this story. First conventional company in the Army to be using M Razors as a form of mobility to increase mobility, increase speed, increase security, so that we'll be a more capable fighting force. Our plan is to train M Razor drivers this week and next week. In two weeks, we're going to go and we're going to take the guys out and we're going to practice using them tactically, uh, you, doing patrol base operations, doing assaults on a pre-planned objective, and uh, we're going to develop some troop leading procedures and some tactical procedures for future operations. We'll go out and, and use them as part of a brigade operation to see how they increase our combat power, our mobility, and our lethality. A handful of Marines from 2nd Marine Regiment recently completed a two-week basic scout sniper preparation course as an introduction to the training they will go through in order to become a scout sniper. Marine Sergeant Austin Long finds out what it takes in this report. I think the biggest mindset to have is like the don't quit mentality. Like things get tough. It's a physically demanding job. You carry heavy packs over long distances with a very high expectation for what your mission is. You're asked to do a lot. And these guys, they have the heart and they have what it takes to just keep putting in the time and effort to get better at what they're doing so that they continue doing a better job and getting better themselves in the long run. We're just focusing in on a lot of the training that the Scout Sniper Basic Course does, stalking, land navigation, observation. We're trying to hit all these wickets and prepare these guys for potential school seats. Also, we're trying to evaluate how good they are at them after they've been instructed on how to execute them properly. Now that we have a lot of the foundations like built, we can take everything to the next level as far as like getting into mission planning, how they're going to be conducting missions, different things like that that are more directly applicable to executing a mission. We have a smaller number now than we started with, and so the guys that stuck with it and, and finished out the course, like we have, they have a really good outlook. During the Korean War, there were many lives lost in hard-fought mountain battles across the Korean Peninsula. Because of the terrain, many of these bodies were never recovered. Army Staff Sergeant Jacob Brayman joins a team of U.S. and Korean soldiers who seek proper respect for their fallen brothers in arms. Dabudong Mountain was one of the deadliest battlegrounds during the Korean War. Climbing up the steep slope is not easy, but the importance of the job at hand makes the steady climb one to remember. Since 2012, I have participated in four remains excavations and have found four sets of remains. I could feel their pain and sorrow during the war when I found them. It was an honor for me to find them and give them due respect. I feel it's important because uh, back in the Korean War, obviously I wasn't alive, but I feel like soldiers that, that gave the ultimate sacrifice deserve the proper uh, burials and, and deserve to be recognized for the ultimate sacrifice that they gave. Working as a team, Republic of Korea and U.S. service members not only excavate remains in the mountain, but also have an opportunity to work together hand in hand. I think it is meaningful to work with U.S. soldiers. During the Korean War, both U.S. soldiers and our grandfathers fought together, and now we are working together on the same mountain. I am honored to be part of this, and I'm pretty sure the Rock U.S. Alliance will get stronger through this event. It was exciting because that means, you know, we weren't out here digging for nothing, and, uh, we got to work alongside our Katusas in doing so, and it was, a, it was a great opportunity. Army Staff Sergeant Jacob Raymond, Dabudong, Korea. In May of 1945, lineage units from the Colorado and Oklahoma National Guard liberated the Dachau concentration camp near Munich, Germany. Seventy years later, 
guardsmen from these states are visiting Dachau to commemorate the liberation. Army Staff Sergeant Christopher Bruce files this report. On April 29, 1945, soldiers from the 157th Infantry Regiment, 45th Infantry Division, made their way through the woods on orders to liberate a small prisoner camp. Soon they would learn of the horror that is called Dachau. Nazi SS soldiers killed a documented 32,000 people and thousands more undocumented deaths occurred. Today at the Dachau Concentration Camp Memorial Site, thousands gathered to commemorate the liberation of the camp 70 years later. Jack Adler attended the ceremony. He was a victim of the Holocaust and describes the horrible conditions. Daily food ration consisted of a slice of bread and a bowl of soup. People were dying from malnutrition, disease by the thousands. People were taken out to extermination camps, concentration camps by the thousands. Jack lost his entire family, mother, father, and two siblings in the Holocaust. He was at many concentration camps, including the infamous Auschwitz, before transferring to Dachau. After he was liberated, he moved to the United States and joined the army, serving in the Korean War. When I went into the army, they had a draft. And I, and I could have gotten an exemption because if you were in college, you could have gotten it. But I want to say, the only way I could say thank you is serve in the service. Guardsmen from two states, Colorado and Oklahoma, joined together in the ceremony at a wreath laying. The two states share the liberating unit's lineage. Major General Robbie Asher, the adjutant general for Oklahoma, says we must never forget. I think it was important that we were here today in the celebration we went through in the ceremony. The uh, country of Germany has recognized that Dachau were wrong, and they've recognized that. And while they can't right that wrong, they want to make sure that the world knows of that wrong so it is never repeated. Reporting for the Oklahoma National Guard from Dachau, Germany, I'm Army Staff Sergeant Christopher Bruce. I'm Lieutenant Commander Joy Dirks. I'm here in Kathmandu working with the uh, joint team uh, doing real world ops supporting the people of Nepal um, with our mission to deliver relief supplies and assist their government in helping the people, um, especially outside the region. And I'm from Ellicott City, Maryland, and I'd like to say hi to my family. Um, my parents are there and my um, friends. So. Thank you all for all your support. I really appreciate it. Hi, I'm Sergeant Holtz with the 14th Quartermaster here in Beyond the Horizons in El Salvador. I want to give a shout out to my mom, Debbie Holtz. We'll see you soon, mom. Coming up, country star Trace Adkins performs for service members at Ramstein Air Base. And we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members, as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. What was the largest Nazi concentration camp during World War II? The answer when we return. This is your place. This is where you'll serve America best. Your future's in the sky. Since the dawn of the Air Force, the Air Force Reserve has stood ready to help protect America when needed. You see, the way the Air Force Reserve feel about it, they're fighting and they're flying for the safety of our people at home, our mothers and fathers and our sisters and brothers. America will have overwhelming superiority in the air. Keep that war from our own shores, our cities, and our homes. Vengeance against those who would destroy our way of life. Our 70,000 citizen airmen come from all walks of life. Probably many from your own neighborhood. Who all share a love of country and a passion for service. I 
Now make no mistake about this thing. The pilot is not the most important fellow inside this plane. It's teamwork. And each member of the team is just as important as the next one. Most importantly, our citizen airmen bring a diverse skill set to support the fight. In air, space, and cyberspace. today and tomorrow and the next day until we win is a war of the air. What was the largest Nazi concentration camp during World War II? The answer is A, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Providing security at an Air Force base is a 24-7 job. Even in the dead of night, protection for people and facilities continues. Wright-Patterson broadcaster Matthew Klaus takes us on a ride-along to find out what happens when most of us are asleep. The jurisdiction at wright Pat is quite encompassing. We have inside the fence, which in its own right still keeps us quite frequently busy. But we also have concurrent jurisdiction, which means that we're on roads that are owned and co-owned by the state. Basically, those are roads that are immediately on the fence line of the base or places where the base has property. We can exercise law enforcement rights there, and so can the state. So very well one day you may see a Fairborne cruiser on a stop in this location or, or vice versa, a Riverside cruiser. But at the same time, the very next day, you may see one of our cars out there. Control place two with a code five Ohio, permission to code nine two. They handle same. Hey, how you doing tonight? Good, how are you? Doing all right, man. The reason I'm stopping you is because you're doing excessive. You're doing 56 and a 45, my man. 56? Yeah, I got you on the radar. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries, man. All right, hang tight for me. We'll be right back with you, OK? Cool. A lot of the times, we're just looking for inconsistencies in stories. You tell me one thing, and then 20 seconds later, you tell me a different thing. I know you're starting to start the process of a why, basically. Um, but he was consistent throughout. Um, looks like he just got caught short, and sometimes not everybody needs a ticket. Basically cruising through. Looking for anybody suspicious back here, looking to see if anybody's getting into, uh, into people's personal belongings. Uh, and it's never anything forced. For the most part, it's usually people leaving their cars unlocked, uh, leaving things that are in plain sight within the vehicle that if the car's unlocked, it's just as easy as walking, opening the door, and taking those belongings out of the vehicle, and they're really gone without a trace, and you never know until the next day when the people come out for work. All this cone setup is for the influx of people that come through about, starting about 7 o'clock, actually court till 7, uh, till about solid 8, 39 o'clock. So what we try to do is we set these cones to alleviate that pressure at the gate to facilitate people still being able to get to work on time and not being stuck at the gate. And I know that's, that's a big complaint for a lot of people. We're just doing the best that we can to, uh, to facilitate the, the people getting to work on time, but still providing a safe environment for people to come in. More often than not, we have a little bit more going on, but it, it was a Tuesday evening. But given the circumstance that, you know, not a lot of stuff happened, just goes to show that the job was accomplished tonight and things were prevented. Anytime that I, you know, the handcuffs are still in their pouch and, and people aren't going to jail, is, is a good night. Clear. He's known by the words honky tonk badonka donk, and he's bringing his guitar lyrics and country twang to service members in Germany. Air Force senior airman Lindy Pata brings us this backstage pass. When you think of country music, I think one of the names that comes to mind is Trace Atkins. So when I found out that he was coming here, I was very excited. In celebration of the Grand Ole Opry's 90th anniversary, Grammy-nominated superstar Trace Atkins performed a free concert at Ramstein Air Base during his 10-day three-country USO tour. If you have an opportunity to 
rub shoulders with heroes, you should do that at every every chance you get because it's uh, it's just uh, it's something that maybe will rub off on you a little bit. Before the concert, a few lucky winners were able to meet and greet Trace backstage. When we walked up to meet him, my uh, my best friend Shannon and I, all she could say was. Oh my, you have a deep voice. <laughs> so there was a lot of excitement, there was a lot of nervousness, um, but just happiness overall. Aaron and Shannon weren't the only ones excited for the concert. I'm probably having twice as much fun up here as you are, so you better really try hard because I'm having a good time, all right? He really enjoyed being here, and you could tell from the way that he was performing and the way that he was talking to the crowd. He was having a great time, and it made everyone there have such a good time. Senior Airman Lindy Pata, Ramstein Air Base, Germany. Divids is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, Divids gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at DividsHub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at dividshub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divids has to offer as we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, In the Fight.